Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Press, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. Martin Luther has begun his discussion about the church. What is the church? Martin Luther is giving us a biblical description of what the church is. The church is God's holy people. Those who are washed in the precious blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, washes away our sins, and we are sanctified by the Holy Spirit for service to God. We are the light of the world. And the Roman Catholic Church, however, opposes the church. It is anti-church. In the Roman Catholic Church, the church means Pope and all of his institutions. Roman Catholic canon law, uh, the Pope's uh, authority, that of the authority of his bishops and his priests, together with Mary and all the other absurdities of the Roman Catholic Church, and they lord over God's people. Forbidden in the Scripture. This positively identifies the Roman Catholic Church as the synagogue of Satan. It is uh, anti-church, the counter-church, counterfeit church. It is not established by God. It is established by Satan for the purpose of leading God's people astray. It replaces grace with works. It replaces Christ with the Pope. And uh, it, it was clearly understood what it was 500 years ago at the time of the Protestant Reformation and beyond and before that. And it, uh, it needs to be understood by God's people today. Now, Martin Luther continues, he says, if the words, quote, I believe that there is a holy Christian people, unquote, had been used in the, in the children's creed, all the misery connected with this meaningless and obscure word, church, might easily be, have been avoided. For the words, quote, Christian holy people, unquote, would have brought with them clearly and powerfully the proper understanding and judgment of what is and what is not church. Whoever would have heard the words Christian holy people could have promptly concluded that the Pope is no people, much less a holy Christian people. So too the bishops, the priests, the monks are not holy, not holy Christian people, for they do not believe in Christ nor do they lead a holy life, but are rather the wicked and shameful people of the devil. Okay, Just like Jesus cursed the Pharisees and the Sadducees. You are a den of vipers. You're, you're of your father the devil, and his works you will do. Modern day Pharisees and Sadducees are no, no less than the Pope, his bishops, his priests, and his monks. Okay? Does he who does not truly believe in Christ is not Christian or a Christian? He who does not have the Holy Spirit against sin is not holy. Consequently, they cannot be, quote, a Christian holy people, unquote. That is, sancta et catholica ecclesia, ecclesia. Okay? I'm sorry for the Latin. I butcher it every time I try to read it. My apologies to the listeners. But still, Martin Luther occasionally uses Latin to make emphasis here. But he's clearly made the distinction between God's people and those who are not God's people. It's those who are sanctified by Christ, set apart for his service, who love him, obey him, and repent of their sins, and whose heart, upon whose heart is written God's law. 
Now that cannot be said of the Pope and his priests and his monks and his cardinals and his bishops and the whole lot of them. They care nothing for the gospel except to use it to deceive God's people and then convert them from the grace of Almighty God to works, earning salvation of their own merit and sharing the merit of the dead saints of the Roman Catholic Church. It's a counterfeit and not even a good counterfeit of the true body of Christ. Now, he says, but since we use this meaningless word, church, in the children's creed, the common man thinks of the stone house called a church as painted by the artists, or at best they paint the apostles, disciples, and the mother of God as on Pentecost with the Holy Spirit hovering over them. Okay? First of all, I will just make the illusion that the Roman Catholic Church is here spoken of as having regarded the institution as the church. Okay? With all of its buildings, with all of its fancy cathedrals, and with all of its idolatry, all of its carved and painted images and idols, which are the equivalent of the Pope and the bishops and the priests, and they've created their own definition for the word church, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the church that's, that's spoken of in the Scripture. Okay? He said, even this is still bearable, but they are the holy Christian people of a specific time. In this case, the beginning. Ecclesia, however, should mean the holy Christian people, not only the days of the apostles, who are long since dead, but to the end of the world, so that there is always a holy Christian people on the earth in whom Christ lives, works, and rules for redemption. That's some more Latin. Quote, through grace and the remission of sins, unquote, and the Holy Spirit, per, <coughs> pervivicationum et sanctificationum, okay, more Latin, quote, through daily purging of sin and renewal of life. Look, this is, this is clearly where the true church and the false church depart. In the true church, there is a daily purging of sin. Every true member of the body of Christ, the church, purges sin from his life. He's in a perpetual state of repentance, okay, and becoming more Christ-like. God has written his law upon his heart, and he's convicted of his sin, and he repents of his sin, confesses his sin, and picks up and carries on. It's one thing to say that we are forgiven our sins and that you're, and then remain rabid sinners. This is what identifies the papacy. The one who preaches Christ and him crucified, but then lives a life of diabolical sin, continuing to live in the most diabolical fashion. And as if you're a regular listener to Inquisition Update, we've read the sins of the popes. Vickers of Christ, The Dark Side of the Papacy by Peter DeRosa was just one of the many books that we've read and discussed here on Inquisition Update that describe the unrepentant, diabolical lives of the popes. And I don't want to rehearse them all again here, but it's just unspeakable the sinful nature of the historical Pope's world. <clears throat> God's people are continually purging sin from their lives, renewing their lives, so that we do not remain in sin, but are enabled and obliged to lead a new life, abounding in all kinds of good works as the Ten Commandments or the Two Tables of Moses' Law command, and not in old evil works. That is St. Paul's teaching. But the Pope, with his followers, that is, his cardinals, his bishops, his priests, the whole lot, has applied both the name 
and the image of the church to himself and to his vile, accursed mob, that's the cardinals, the bishops, the priests, and the monks, the whole lot of them, under the meaningless word ecclesia or church, etc. Okay? So who is the church, the Roman Catholic Church? The Pope and his henchmen. In the papacy's mind, that's what the church is. Now, the people of the Roman Catholic Church are to be lorded over by the mob at the top. To the degree that the, the once Protestant churches in this land are finding ecumenical unity with the Roman Catholic Church, they too will take on this image, this institutionalization, this hierarchy, and will begin, as is predicted, that they will lord it over the people. Okay? The La Laodiceans, that's what they are. They lord it over the laity. Laodiceans. Okay, they're taking on the form and the image of the Roman Catholic Church. They're forgetting the scriptural definition of the church, and they're taking up the definition of the Roman Catholic Church. Because nevertheless, they give themselves the right name when they call themselves ecclesia. That is, if we interpret this term to agree with their way of life, either Romana or Sancta but do not add, as indeed they cannot, the word Catholica. Now, let me explain something. Martin Luther has entirely different definition for the word Catholic than do I. And I've expressed many, many times my definition of the word Catholic. When I use the word Catholic in my discussion, I'm speaking specifically of the synagogue of Satan, the Roman Catholic Church proper, the Pope, his priests, his nuns, his monks, his cardinals, his bishops, his Roman Catholic canon law, all of his works, all of his sacraments, the buildings, the cathedrals, Everything about it that is anti-Christ, that is the Catholic Church. There is no other Catholic Church but the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, that's not the definition that Martin Luther gives it. Martin Luther uses the word Catholic to describe, to describe the true body of Christ. Now, I have to allow for him to use whatever definition he wants for his words, but I don't want my definition or my use of the word Catholic to be confused with his use of the word Catholic. Now, if that's not complicated enough for you, we'll continue reading it and probably get a little bit more complicated. We're going to do the best we can with what Martin Luther is teaching us about the church. He says, for ecclesia means a people. Okay, The word ecclesia means a people that they are just as the Turks too, an ecclesia, a people. Okay, so there's Martin Luther's definition of the word ecclesia, a people. That could be the Turks, okay, the Muslims. That could be any other people on the earth, right? He is essentially saying that the word ecclesia is not a word that perfectly defines the church, God's holy people. All right? The word ecclesia can be used by anyone, any, uh, any people. All right? Now he continues, he says, ecclesia romana means, quote, a Roman people, unquote, that they are too and indeed much more Roman than the heathen of ancient times were. Ecclesia Romana Sancta means, quote, a holy Roman people, unquote, that they are too, for they, they have invented a holiness far greater than the holiness of Christians, 
or than the holy Christian people possess. Martin Luther's, don't, don't be confused, Martin Luther is saying what the Roman Catholic Church has said always, that it is the one true Roman Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation. It is the holiest of the holy. It is more holy than God's holy people. Okay? You and me, Bible-believing Christians, whose head is Christ, not the Pope. Papacy has always insisted that it is the holiest of the holy. It has a holiness greater than is noted in the true body of Christ. Okay? This is self-professed, obviously. You can't make the synagogue of Satan holy. It's a mere claim. It falls flat on its face as history and prophecy and even current events attest, and in no way can it call itself holy. But instead, it calls itself the most holy Roman Catholic Church. Right? Now he says their holiness is a Roman holiness. Romane Ecclesia. A holiness, quote, of the Roman people, unquote. And they are now even called Sanctissimi Sacrosancti, that is, the most holy, as Virgil speaks of, quote, holy thirst for gold, unquote. <laughs> it is a money-grubbing church, no doubt about it. It is the wealthiest, the most, the church of filthy lucre. There's another term for the Roman Catholic Church, the church of filthy lucre, okay? And he says, and uh, Plot Plotus... Uh, of, quote, the most holy one of all, unquote. These are authors. I, I'm not familiar with them, but he's, he, he's quoting from author, the author Virgil or the, the, the philosopher Virgil and Plautus and taking quotes from them, from them. And he says, for they cannot stand Christian holiness. All right? The Roman Catholic Church cannot stand Christ's righteousness. They can't tolerate it. And so they must create their own holiness. And that's what is the Roman Catholic Church. A created, a man-made institution that professes to be more holy than those people whom God has called and chosen and sanctified and who, will who he will glorify in the end. They claim to be more sanctified, more holy than those for whom Christ died. He continues, he says, Therefore, they are not entitled to the name, quote, Christian church, unquote, or, quote, Christian people, unquote, if for no other reason than that, quote, Christian church, unquote, is a name, and quote unquote Christian holiness and an entity common to all churches and all Christians in the world. Therefore it is called Catholic. Alright? So Martin Luther has just defined the word Catholic as having be, as having described the true Bible believing Christian church all over the world. Okay? But when Martin Luther uses the word Catholic, that's the definition that he pins to this word. His definition differs diametrically with mine. He's allowed to put whatever definition he, want, he likes on the word Catholic, and I likewise am free to use my definition for the word Catholic. Again, Martin Luther uses the word Catholic to describe the universal, Bible-believing, blood-washed church of God, the people of God all over the world. Okay? 
I use the word Catholic strictly to represent the Church of Antichrist, the Roman Catholic Church. So that's the distinction. I, ho I hope not to make this complicated, but I'm the one who has to read Martin Luther's book, and I want you to understand what Martin Luther is saying. Now, he continues, he says, but they have little, if any, regard for this common name and holiness. Instead, they invented a special, higher, different, better holiness than that of others. This is to be known as the Sanctitus or the Sanctitus, Sanctitus Romanae et Ecclesia Romanae Sanctitus. That is, quote, Roman holiness and the holiness of the Roman people, unquote. Right. He says, for Christian holiness, or the holiness common to Christendom, is found where the Holy Spirit gives people faith in Christ and sanctifies them according to Acts chapter 15, verse 9. That is, he renews the heart, the soul, the body, the work and the conduct, inscribing the commandments of God not on tables of stone, but in the hearts of flesh, as is found in Second Corinthians chapter three, verse three. Or, if I may, if I may speak plainly, says Martin Luther, he imparts true knowledge of God, according to the first table of the law so that those whom he enlightens with true faith can resist all heresies, overcome all false ideas and errors, and thus remain pure in the faith in opposition to the devil. Now, I ask my listeners the question. If we possess the Holy Spirit, if we are enlightened by the true faith, then we do indeed resist all heresies. I, for one, resist the papal heresy. We overcome all false ideas and errors. Let me give you an example. We overcome the false idea and the error that is commonly known as futurism, that Daniel's prophecy, the 70 weeks of Daniel, is yet future has not yet been fulfilled when in fact the Bible sets forth the 70th week of Daniel as the very time of the coming of our Messiah 2,000 years ago. Daniel's prophecy is what marks Jesus as our Messiah. Daniel's prophecy predicts that Messiah will come in the flesh during the 70th and final week of that prophecy, and he indeed did come right on time at the very end of the 69th week of years, at the very beginning of the 70th and final week of years, and in the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. He confirmed his covenant in his blood by giving up his own life on the cross, shedding his blood for our, the remission of our sins. The 70th week of Daniel has been perfectly and completely and once and for all filled by the, fulfilled by the Messiah, Jesus, 2,000 years ago. And if we look for a future Antichrist, then we have been deceived. This is a false idea. It is error. And those who are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, who can resist all heresies and overcome false ideas and errors, they denounce futurism as heresy. Martin Luther's got it right. We've come upon the break, so we'll take a little refreshment. We'll be back right after the messages. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio.
years ahead of the dominant media. FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border org C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Gold and silver is tremendously undervalued. Global demand vastly exceeds mine supply by more than 60% annually. There is little in the financial world more certain than a coming explosion in the prices of gold and silver. The U.S. dollar continues to lose value and respect as the world's reserve currency. Our nation faces challenges on many fronts, and a day doesn't pass without another economist bringing forth warnings of impending economic calamity. There has never been a better time than right now to acquire physical gold and silver. Discount Gold and Silver Trading was founded on the principles of truth and honesty. We believe in providing a quality product, quality service, and most importantly, competitive pricing. We provide all forms of precious metals, including American gold, silver, platinum, and rare investment and circulated coins. Silver bars, rounds, and 90% silver bags are on hand for the silver investor. Gold self-directed IRAs are available. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, that's 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update and keep this program on the air, please support First Amendment. And if you wish to contact me personally, please do so. My email address is tom at cwaves.us. Website is inquisitionupdate.org. Okay. Martin Luther says the true body of Christ the church, the true holy Christian people, have the first table of the law written upon their hearts. They put away sin from their lives. They are enlightened by the scriptures as taught to them by the Holy Spirit. They have true faith and they can resist all heresies. Papal heresy, the futurist heresy, and all other false ideas and errors, and thus remain pure in the faith, in that is, we believe in Jesus Christ alone. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Jesus Christ our Messiah alone. We serve only Him, and a stranger's voice we will not follow. And we are in opposition to the devil and his vicar in Rome. Okay? We, the body of Christ, the true Christian church, overcome all false ideas and errors and thus remain pure in the faith of Christ and in opposition to the devil. And how do we oppose the devil? We oppose all of his evil works 
but we also oppose the very fountain of all of those evil works, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the head and master of the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy. Martin Luther, again, I remind my listeners, says of the papacy that it is simply a mask on the face of Satan himself. Right? He also bestows strength and comforts timid, despondent, weak consciences against the accusation and turmoil of sin so that the souls do not succumb or despair and also do not become terrified or torment, pain, death, and the wrath and the judgment of God, but rather comforted and strengthened in hope. They cheerfully, boldly, and joyfully overcome the devil. That's our lot. That's what Christ has prescribed for all of His true people. That we overcome the devil. Not that we serve Him. Not that we ecumenically reunite with Him. Not that we kick Christ off of His throne and put the Pope in His place instead. We serve Christ and Him alone. Against the whole world, if necessary, that's what we do. No matter what it costs us, no matter even if we burn at the stake, we serve Christ and Him alone. We have no other authority in this world. Not if all other authority in this world are in at war with Christ. Okay? Continuing, he says, He also imparts true fear and love of God, so that we do not despise God and become irritated and angry with His wondrous judgments, but love, praise, thank, and honor Him for all that occurs, good and evil. That is called new holy life in the soul, in accordance with the first table of Moses. It is also called, and here's some more Latin, my apologies beforehand, Tres virtues, uh, virtutus, Theologicus, which means, quote, the three principal virtues of Christians, unquote, namely faith, hope, and love. And the Holy Spirit who imparts, does, and effects this. Gained for us by Christ, this therefore called sanctifier or gift giver. Okay? You're sanctified in Christ by the Holy Spirit who gives us life. And he says, For the old Adam is dead and cannot do it, and in addition has to learn from the law that he is unable to do it and that he is dead. He would not know, he would not know this of himself. And Martin Luther's implication is, that the man of sin, the son of perdition, and his entire mob in the Roman Catholic Church do not know that they are dead in trespasses and sins and must be brought to a newness of life in Christ, accepting him and his atonement by faith. The papacy cannot know it. His bishops and cardinals and priests and monks and nuns cannot know it. But we know, we, the body of Christ, the true people of God, know that we were born dead in trespasses and sins and that our sins must be atoned in order for us to be reconciled to God and raised from this mortal life to an immortal one and this corruptible life into an incorruptible one. And we do that by faith in Christ who achieved it all, all by himself, without any help from any of us. We cannot add one thing to our salvation. We can only express doubt. That's the enemy of Christ. Doubt is the enemy of Christ. If we believe Christ and he said, I have redeemed you with my own blood, then that's the way it is. And we have faith in that. We trust him as being the only one capable 
of restoring us to life, we who were born dead in trespasses and sins, we who have repented of our sins and seek the mercy of Almighty God through the shed blood and the grace of God through his, the shedding of, his, of the blood of His own Son, Papacy cannot do that. It's not in him to do that. It's not in the Roman Catholic Church to do that. They must replace the gift of God with servitude and tyranny and works. And they are without hope or help because their works cannot save them. Their pope cannot save them. Their deities cannot save them. Their priests and saints and monks and holy water and the sacraments and the Eucharist and the Mass and all, none of that can save them. There is no salvation in the Roman Catholic Church. There's no repentance in the Roman Catholic Church, as you are well aware if you listen to the Inquisition update very long. We know who we serve. We know, likewise, we are saved. And no one can take that away from us. Not anyone. Our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west. Just like the Scriptures say. So what, what heed should any of us pay to the Pope and his priests and his ecumenical evangelibelly once Protestant pastors who are preaching that we ought to all go back to the Roman Catholic Church, that we've got anything at all in common with the Roman Catholic Church. We have absolutely nothing in common with the Roman Catholic Church, nor do we want anything common with the Roman Catholic Church. It is what it is. It is what it will. It is now what it will ever be until Christ comes to destroy it. That church was born dead it will remain dead, and it will finally be put out of existence by Christ, our Messiah. This is what Martin Luther wants us to know. Now he says, in accordance with the second table, the first table being the first four commandments, the second table being the second four, uh, second, or the, the second table being the remaining six commandments, the fourth being our responsibility to God, the last six being our responsibility to man, his accordance with the second table, the last six commandments, he also sanctifies the Christians in the body and induces them willingly to obey parents and rulers to conduct themselves peacefully and humbly, to be not wrathful, vindictive or malicious, but patient, friendly, obliging, brotherly, and loving, not unchaste, not adulterous or lewd, but chaste and pure, but chaste and pure with wife, child, and servants, or even without wife and child, and on and on. We do not steal. We are not usurious or avaricious. We do not defraud, etc. But we work honorably, support them, we, we support ourselves honestly, we lend willingly, and give and help wherever we can. Okay? Thus, still dealing with the second table of the law, we do not lie. We do not deceive, we do not backbite, but we are kind, truthful, faithful, and trustworthy, and do whatever else the commandments of God prescribe. None of this is common in the Church of Rome. None of it. Martin Luther continues, he said, that is the work of the Holy Spirit who sanctifies and also awakens the body to such a new life until it is perfected in the life beyond. That is what is called, quote, Christian holiness, unquote. And there must always be such people on the earth, even though 
It may be but one or two or three or only children. Unfortunately, only a few of them are old folks. Martin Luther speaking of his own day 500 years ago. And it's still true today. And those who are not should not count themselves as Christians, nor should they be comforted with much babbling about forgiveness of sins and the grace of Christ as though they were Christians like the antinomians do. Now I'm going to refresh your memory. The antinomians, according to Martin Luther, believed and taught the grace of God through faith in Christ. But they continued to live in sin. Okay? They were illogical. The Bible says we are to repent of sin. Okay? But the antinomians accepted God's grace through faith in Christ and the washing away of their sins, but they gleefully continued in sin. Okay? That's the antinomians. That's what they believe. Whenever you hear the term antinomians, <coughs> you automatically know that they preach the true Christian faith, but they don't practice it. It's hypocrisy, isn't it? You shall know them by their fruits, the Scripture says. You shall know God's people by their fruits. They do not sin. And if they sin, they have an advocate with the Father. But they're continually being sanctified and set apart from the world. They're in the world, but they're not of it. Okay? Their lives are a living sacrifice holy and acceptable before the Lord. They are not whoremongers. They are not usurious. They are not liars. But the antinomians were. They continued in sin. Okay? There was no repentance in them. Whenever you hear the term antinomians, that's who they are. You have to look very carefully at their lives to determine what they believe shall know them by their fruits. Now, speaking of the antinomians, he says, For they, having rejected and being unable to understand the Ten Commandments, preach much about the grace of Christ, yet they strengthen and comfort only those who remain in their sins, telling them not to fear or to be terrified by sins, since they are all removed by Christ. All their sins are removed by Christ. They see and yet they let the people go on in their public sins without any renewal or reformation of their lives. Thus it becomes quite evident that they truly fail to understand the faith in Christ and thereby abrogate both, the, when, uh, abrogate both when they preach about it. How can he speak lightly about the works of the Holy Spirit in the first table, about comfort, grace, forgiveness of sins, who does not heed and practice the works of the Holy Spirit in the second table, which he can understand and experience, while he has never attempted or experienced those of the first table. Therefore, it is certain that they neither have nor understand Christ or the Holy Spirit, and their talk is nothing but froth on the tongue, and they are, they are as already said, true Nestorius's and Eutyches's who confess or teach Christ in the premise, in the substance, and yet deny him in the conclusion or the idiomata. That is, they teach Christ and yet destroy him through their teaching. Very clever, these antinomians. They appear for all outward appearance to be Christians in what they preach and teach, but their fruits bear them out. They preach the gospel with their lips, but they destroy the gospel with their lives. Don't be an antinomian. And antinomianism defines the Roman Catholic Church. Their works bear them out. They replace Christ. They worship an idol. A man and a piece of bread. They preach Jesus all the time. They claim to be Christians. 
And many of them, if you know Roman Catholics, they they are just devout in their faith. But their works find them out. Now he says, all this then has been said about Christian holiness, which the Pope does not want. He has to have one that is much holier. Namely, that found in the description of chasubles, conchers, cowls, garb, food, festivals, days, monkery, nunnery, masses, saint worship, and countless other items of an external, bodily, transitory nature. In other words, it's worldly. No spiritual change has taken place. They have the outward appearance of holiness with all their chasubles, some of their vestments is what it's referring to if you don't know what a chasuble is, conchers, special haircuts. You've seen the old woodcut paintings of the old Roman Catholic priests who have a special haircut where they're either, they either have a patch of hair right on the top of their head and they're shaved around the sidewalls, or vice versa, they have a shaving around the tempor- temporals of their of their head like a halo. And uh, that is an outward sign of their so-called holiness. Okay, when, whenever you see someone someone with this fancy haircut, then you just naturally genuflect. You get down on your knees, and you cross yourself and say, "Bless you, Holy Father." It's 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 all it's all fleshly, religious nonsense is what it is. There's no con- there's no conversion of the heart. It's all an outward show of religiosity. Okay, all the fancy vestments, all the tonsures, all the cowls, and all the garb, all the food, festivals, days, monks, nuns, masses, wor- uh, saint worship, and countless other items of an external bodily, transitory, that is worldly nature. Whether one lives under it, without faith, fear of God, hope, love, and whatever the Holy Spirit, according to the first tablet, effects, or in misbelief, uncertainty of heart, doubts, contempt of God, impatient with God, and false trust in works, that is, idolatry, not in the grace of Christ and his merit alone, but in the atonement of works, even selling the surplus of one or another's works and taking in exchange all the goods and the wealth of this world as well earned. Okay? This is what defines all of these things that we're talking about is perfectly visible in the Roman Catholic Church. The worst of all is that claiming the works of the saints of the Roman Catholic Church as being sufficient not only to save themselves, but that their excess works can be stored in a bank whose vault, who, the key of the vault of that excess good works is in the possession of the Pope alone, and he can turn that key, reach into the bank, grab all kinds of these extra works and grace that is earned by the saints and impart them to you for just the right amount of money or just the right amount of property that you bequeath to the church. The buying and selling of ecclesiastical favor, the buying and selling of forgiveness of sins, it's all a sham. And it has made the Roman Catholic Church the most wealthy institution in the history of the world. That's the power they have over the governments of the world, too. I want my listeners to understand. Martin Luther sees it just the way it exists to this very day. 500 years ago, nothing has changed. Okay? Pope believes in the merit of the good works of the saints as having the power to save themselves and the power to save sinners. That's why they worship and pray to the saints in the Roman Catholic Church, praying for ecclesiastical favor. And, of course, if they want that favor, they have to do a favor for the Pope. 
Some of those favors I can't even speak about here on Inquisition Update. All right? The buying and selling of the surplus grace earned by the saints and taking in exchange for that all the goods and wealth of the world and receiving it as though it were well earned. Okay? Pope thinks this is a, a, a righteous way to make a living. And how much living is that? All the goods and all the wealth of the world. That's what has been given <clears throat> in the name of indulgences to the papacy. Whole lands, all possessions. Gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, anything in this world of value, anything that the Pope covets the most, if you give it to the Pope, he will open the doors of heaven, and you can even go in without even going to purgatory if you give him the right gift. What a counterfeit system it is. It shouldn't fool anyone, but it has fooled the whole world especially our politicians, the ones who lord over us every day, who know nothing about the grace and the faith of Jesus Christ, and who obviously don't have a clue who the Antichrist is. Martin Luther says, All that is of no consequence, because a man may be holier than Christian holiness itself. Okay? Who is that man that professes to be holier than Christian holiness itself? Papacy. The papacy and the institution of the Roman Catholic Church. You can't get this wrong. Clearly, we can see the difference between God's true holy people and that which is in the world that calls itself God's true holy people, the church. Belong to either one or the other. It's time for us to make a clear distinction so that we can make the correct choice. And do it in Jesus' name and to Him alone we give thanks. That's all we have for today. Blessings in the name of the one who caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease 2,000 years ago. Christ the righteous. See you tomorrow. Visit crossthborder.org, C R O S S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthborder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border dot org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org